Hello, friends. Welcome to Tuesday Night Bible Study. This is not our normal way of doing things, as you know. Thanks to the coronavirus, we're having the opportunity to join you in your home with continuing our study of the book of Genesis. We intend to complete the entire book, hopefully by this summer. We intend to keep, to keep sending you the handouts, as we always have, that will accompany the lecture that I give on the Bible study material, and I hope you'll join us each Tuesday. It is our goal to every Tuesday have the materials available to you both in handout form and this video, and chapter by chapter continue our way through the book of Genesis. While we cannot be with you in person, we invite you, if you so desire, to make comments to ask questions about the Bible study in the response form that you have in the downloadable materials before you. I'll do my best after each Bible study and the days following to respond to every question, and this will give us a way to have a bit of interaction together using this format. I want to make you aware of one other opportunity that we are making available to the Francis Asbury community during these days of the coronavirus. Pastor Mike, Mike Powers, is going to give us a prayer opportunity to invite you to join our Monday prayer meeting to share your prayer requests with the team that gathers on Monday for prayer. We'll be doing this live using the Zoom technology to have a prayer meeting once a week. So watch for that material as we make it, as we make you aware of that information in the days ahead. I do look forward for these days together. We anticipate we'll meet this way at least for a few weeks, potentially for the remainder of the study of Genesis, depending on what happens in our world. I believe that God is in this and that these are opportunities for us to trust him in new ways and go deeper in our faith with him. May God bless us as we launch into this new endeavor together. Today we're going to be studying Genesis chapter 32 and 33, actually one of my favorite chapters in all of the Bible. I've entitled it The Magnificent Limp. Could we begin our Bible study together in prayer? Father, we invite your spirit to enable us to understand your word. We invite you to be our teacher. Thank you for technology that enables us to meet this way and we invite you to work in us through your word and through your spirit in a way that changes us because we've met with you. In Jesus' name and for the sake of his kingdom, amen. When most of us think of the subject of spiritual warfare, we think in terms of combat with Satan and his demonic forces. But the life of Jacob reminds us that there's another dimension to spiritual warfare that most of us have not considered. Jacob's greatest combat was not with Satan. It was not with his brother. It was not with his father-in-law. The greatest spiritual conflict of his life is when he found himself in a wrestling match with God himself. This was the crisis, the greatest crisis of his life. If you've got your notes there in front of you, I invite you to follow along as we just work our way through chapters 32 and 33 of Genesis. Jacob's defining moment. The greatest crisis of Jacob's life was not his conflict with his brother Esau. It was not his conflict with his father-in-law Laban. In the last several weeks, we've seen how those crises were very defining in Jacob's life. But the greatest 
crisis of his life was not there. The greatest antagonist he faced was God. Though he had been able to deceive, manipulate, and control Esau and Laban, when it came to his wrestling match with God, Jacob finally came to the end of himself. I love that phrase, the end of himself. I'm going to say it again. Jacob finally came to the end of Jacob. Because when we come to the end of our own resources, our own abilities, even our own ability to comprehend, this is the moment that God waits for when he steps in and does what only God can do. This is not Jacob's first encounter with God. You'll remember a few weeks ago when we looked at the stairway to heaven, also known as Jacob's Ladder, in Genesis 28. As Jacob was leaving Canaan, he met God and had what we could call a conversion experience. He experienced God. But here at Peniel, in chapter 32, Jacob experienced the blank there is a second work of grace. He had a deeper encounter with God. His first encounter was authentic and certainly significant, but Jacob would have never been what God called him to be or done what would never have done what God called him to do without this deeper work at Peniel. The chart there in your notes is the chart I gave you a few weeks ago when we talked about the stairway to heaven. At Bethel, Jacob had encountered the house of God, Bethel, house of God. But at Peniel, he met the face of God. What a difference. At Bethel, Jacob basically was passive. He slept as God saved him. But at Peniel, this is hard. It was a wrestling match that went on all night. At Bethel, Jacob experienced a change of status. But at Peniel, as we'll shortly see, Jacob experienced a change of nature. He got a new name. At Bethel, Jacob discovered what God can do for me. But at Peniel, Jacob discovered what God wants to do in me. At Bethel, Jacob was still Jacob. But at Peniel, Jacob became Israel, a new creature. At Bethel, though he was saved, though he had met God, Jacob's life was still self-absorbed with himself. It's all about me. But at Peniel, for the first time in his life, Jacob became focused on God and on other people and God's purposes in the world. At Bethel, we could call it the doctrine of justification when Jacob was made right with God. But at Peniel, we're introduced to that deeper work of sanctification, what God wants to do in us. The key word in the two chapters we're going to be studying this today in this passage is the word face. What an interesting word. This emphasis is sometimes lost in the English translations. It's not in your notes, but the first Reference to the word face is in chapter 32, verse 16, where it simply says, These he handed over to his servants, every drove by itself, and said to his servants, Pass on ahead of me. The Hebrew literally said, says, Pass before my face. In verse 20, five times, the word face is used in Hebrew. Listen to how it's 
written. I've got it there in your notes. Jacob thought, I may appease Esau. The word appease is I may cover his face. With the present I send him that goes ahead of me, I may cover his face by the present I'm sending before my face. And afterward, I shall see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. In the Hebrew, it says literally, perhaps he will lift my face. And so the present passed ahead of him before his face. In verse 30, when he's had the wrestling match, Jacob names the place where he encountered God, Peniel, face of God. Not just the house of God, not just the presence of God, but I've seen God face to face. And then perhaps most dramatic and most surprising of all, is chapter 33, verse 10, where when Jacob meets finally his brother Esau after 20 years absence, and Jacob says to his brother, because I've seen your face, which is like seeing the face of God. Jacob's face reminds, excuse me, Esau's face with face to face with his reconciled brother, reminds Jacob of the face of God he had seen just the night before. My notes there in your paper, Jacob is terrified at the prospect of facing up to his past, literally, and of facing his estranged brother, this is just too personal, too intimate, too close to home. He prefers to live in denial and avoidance, hiding in the rear behind others. When he sent the present, Jacob was in the back, so afraid to face his brother, to face his past. But when he gets face to face with God, there's the blank, with God, all his other fears are immediately reduced in size. When he does see his brother's face, he recognizes the likeness of God. So face is what we're watching for. Jacob's face, Esau's face, God's face. Facing our past, facing the truth, facing reality. Let me walk our way through the two chapters. I'm not going to read them. You have your scriptures. You can read them. But let me tell you what's going on. And then I want to focus particularly on that wrestling match. In chapter 32, verses 1 to 2, we see where the angels meet Jacob. 20 years earlier, Jacob had been met by angels as he left Canaan. And now they greet him on his return. As he faces his greatest challenge, God reminds him that the latter is still working. In other words, those angels coming and going are still coming and going. The gate of heaven is still open. So as Jacob faces what he's so afraid to face, God reassures him of his presence through the angels. Letter B, Genesis 32, verses 3 to 12, Jacob prays. When he hears that his brother Esau is coming to meet him with 400 men, he's greatly afraid and distressed. He divides his family and possession into two camps and prays like he's never prayed before. I put the words to his prayer there in your notes, verses 9 to 12. Let me read them with you. Listen to this prayer. Jacob's never prayed this way in his life. O oh God of my father Abraham and God of my father Isaac, O oh Lord who said to me, return to your country, 
In other words, I'm only here because I obeyed your voice and to your kindred that I may do you good. I'm not worthy of the least of all the deeds and steadfast love. We've never hear, heard proud Jacob talk about his unworthiness and all the faithfulness that you have shown to your servant. For with only my staff, I crossed this Jordan 20 years ago, and now I have become two camps. Oh, how you've prospered me. Verse 11, please deliver me. That's the heart of his prayer. Oh God, deliver me from the hand of my brother. He's coming with 400 men, surely to kill me. For I fear him that he may come and attack me and the mothers with the children. For you said, I will surely do you good and make your offspring as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for multitude. What a prayer. Humbly acknowledging his unworthiness Jacob reminds God that he is in this place only because he's obeying a clear command. He also reminds God of his promises. The heart of his prayer is a cry for help. Deliver me. Help. Jacob's desperate circumstances have had the beneficial effect. In other words, this crisis he's facing, when it feels like the wheels are coming off and all is lost, actually has a beneficial result in two things, clearing his thinking and secondly, making him bold in prayer. Sometimes when life doesn't turn out the way we think it should, it clears our thinking and enables us to pray like we've never prayed before to pray the kind of prayer that God actually hears. Letter C. Jacob sends a lavish gift to his brother Esau. Some may see Jacob's gift to his brother, 550 animals, <laughs> as a desperate attempt to buy his favor, a sort of bribe. But perhaps it should be understood as a form of restitution. Jacob is, in, is acknowledging his past sins and seeking to make amends. Lavishly, he's doing everything he knows how to do to say to his brother who he treated so despicably, who he sinned against, brother, I'm sorry. I know now what I did was wrong. Can I make things right in Genesis 32, verses 22 to 32, we see a wrestling match. We're going to come back to this in a moment and read this passage in its entirety. But everything about this wrestling match is mysterious. Both Jacob and the reader, that's us, must interpret what it means. Who is wrestling Jacob? The text only says that a man attacked him. And why does he attack him? What is the attacker's intention? It's a mystery who won. When the story is concluded, can you tell who the winner and who the loser is? And why won't the wounded hip heal? Why was it permanent? Jacob limped for the rest of his life. And what does this wrestling match mean? I'm so glad you asked. That's why we're studying this passage. Because the main part of our lesson will focus on these verses, we'll return to these questions in a few moments. In chapter 33, we have how it all comes down. Let me read just a few verses I'm reading from the English Standard Version. I'm in chapter 33. And Jacob lifted up his eyes. This is after the all-night wrestling match. The next morning, this is what happens. Jacob lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, Esau was coming with 400 men. 
So he divided the children among Leah and Rachel and the two female servants, and he put the servants with their children in front, then Leah with her children, and Rachel and Joseph last of all. He himself went before them. He's ready to face his brother. He's ready to face his past. He went before them, bowing himself to the ground seven times, and he came near to his brother. Verse 4, But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. Rather than getting revenge by killing his brother, Esau embraces and kisses his former enemy in one of the most moving scenes in the entire Bible. God had obviously been working in Esau's heart too. Perhaps Jacob's lavish gift had accomplished its purpose. Perhaps the sight of his bullying, belligerent brother humbly limping toward him caused Esau's heart to melt. For Jacob, Esau's face reflects the likeness of the one he had wrestled with the night before. Verse 10, I have seen your face, which is like seeing the face of God. And finally, in the last part of it, Genesis 33, verses 12 to 20, we see that though reconciled, the brothers recognize they represent two separate ways of life that are very different, and they agree to separate. Esau lives in Seir, and Jacob, now called Israel, lives in Shechem, where he buys some land and builds. Do you see it there in the last verse? Do you see it in verse 20? What does Jacob build? If you've been following the life of Jacob for the last several weeks during our studies, you'll remember that Jacob loved to build monuments. He doesn't build a monument this time. Verse 20 tells us there he erected an altar not a pillar, and called it El Elohe Israel, the God of Israel. What an amazing passage. Though there's so many different things we could say, so many different directions we could go in studying this amazing passage, I want to focus on chapter 32, verses 22 to 32. That wrestling match between the rascal Jacob and the Holy One. It went on all night. Can I read those verses to you? Let's read them in their entirety. Genesis chapter 32, beginning at verse 22. That same night, Jacob arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, My name is Jacob, the deceiver, the cheat, the liar. Verse 28. Then the man said to him, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please 
tell me your name. But the man said, why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose upon him as he passed Peniel, limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. I'm at Roman numeral number three in your notes. Let's make these comments about the text. A, this is a wrestling match. It's not a fist fight. It's not a knife fight. It's not a duel with swords or with pistols. The purpose of wrestling, think about this. Your enemy, the purpose is not to kill him. If it was a duel or a sword fight, the purpose is to kill. But in wrestling, the purpose is to dominate, to control, to manipulate, to pin your opponent to the mat, to force your uncle, your opponent to say, uncle, wrestling is a full body contact event. It is face to face and extremely intimate. If you've ever wrestled, that takes me right back to high school sports class. Wrestling is very intimate. It's full body contact. And the point of wrestling is to dominate your opponent, not to kill him. This was a wrestling match. A man attacked in the night, Jacob, and the wrestling began. Letter B, the fight is started by a mysterious man. Jacob didn't start this fight. His adversary did. Who is this one who attacks him in the dark? And what does he want? Why is he attacking me? The prophet Hosea, chapter 12, verses 3 to 4, tells us that he was an angel. When Jacob asks his name in Genesis 32, the adversary replies with a mysterious, why do you ask? I told you everything about this fight is mysterious. Why do you ask? I think the implication of that question is, Jacob, do I have to really tell you who I am? Don't you know by now who you're fighting? Jacob's conclusion about his adversary's identity is reflected in the name he gives to the place, Peniel, the face of God. Jacob knew who he was, though he never explicitly stated his identity. Letter C, this wrestling match with God, just listen to some of the details. It occurred at night, meaning they were fighting in the dark. It was impossible to see clearly. This demands discernment and faith. We walk by faith, not by sight. I'd love to share testimonies with some of you, but many of you in your wrestlings with the meaning of God and his ways in our lives we find ourselves wrestling in the dark, even as Jesus did in Gethsemane late at night. Can you see when the sun has set? Secondly, this wrestling match occurred when Jacob was alone. Neither his mother nor his wives were there to help him out as they had been in the past. This was a battle he had to fight by himself. 
The third bullet there, this was a wrestling match with God that occurred over a lengthy period of time, several hours. While some conflicts can be won in an instant, if you're using swords or guns, a wrestling match takes a long time. The battle for the surrender of the will is typically a long one. That's what God has been trying to do in Jacob's life, life since his birth. When he was born wrestling with his brother Esau in the womb, conquer Jacob's will. Bring him to that place of full, unconditional surrender. That battle is a long one. Letter D. The unknown visitor asked Jacob his name. You may remember a few chapters earlier when Jacob dressed up like his brother Esau to deceive his old man Isaac blind into giving him the blessing. When Isaac asked Jacob, what is your name? Jacob lied. He didn't tell him the truth about his identity. He said, I'm Esau. But this time, the visitor asks Jacob his name. We should not imagine that the questioner doesn't know the answer to that question. In answering, Jacob is doing more than giving information. He is confessing the truth. I'm Jacob. And do you remember the meaning of the name? I'm a liar. I'm a cheater. I'm a deceiver. I'm a manipulator. For the first time in his life, we're aware of the fact that Jacob is finally self aware. He recognizes the truth about what a no good, low down, dirty, rotten bum he really is. He's self aware. I'm Jacob. That is who I am. That is my identity. Before he can receive a new nature, he must confess the truth about his old nature. Letter E. When the conflict's outcome seems to be pointing to a draw, Jacob's adversary uses miraculous powers. It almost doesn't feel fair to touch his hip and it's dislocated. No longer able to wrestle effectively, Jacob now can't wrestle. He can only cling. He can only hold on. He's lost his strength to wrestle. All he can do is hold on. I will not let you go. The new strategy is surprisingly effective. I think the text is encouraging some of us. Would you quit fighting God and just hold on <laughs> for dear life? Jacob wins the wrestling match by losing. And he receives a new name and a divine blessing. On the last page of your study notes, underneath the questions for discussion, I put an old gospel song that I stumbled on this week. Not by wrestling, but by clinging. Oh, these are amazing words. Not by wrestling, but by clinging shall we be most blessed. Wrestling only brings us sorrow. Clinging brings us rest. You can read the rest of those wonderful verses and maybe find the tune to sing it to. Let's move on to letter F. Jacob's wound, the dislocation of his hip, apparently never heals for the rest of his life. And his limp remains his most distinctive physical trait for the rest of his life. The handicap has such significance 
that the nation of Israel made it a dietary regulation to refrain from eating the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket so that they would remember this wrestling match forever. I picture old Jacob, now named Israel, the rest of his life limping with a cane. But there was something so distinguished and elegant about that cane and that limp that it made him a saint, a saint of God. So what are we to learn from a story like this? In the moments that remain, let me point out just a number of lessons learned from Jacob and his wrestling match. In no particular order, but let me begin by saying, A, one lesson we should learn from this story is that our real struggle in life, are you listening, is with God. It's not with Satan. It's not with your enemy. It's not with your boss. It's not with the world economy. It's not with the coronavirus. Our real struggle in life, for all of us, is with God. Like Jacob, we may imagine that our ultimate battles are with other people or with difficult circumstances or even with demonic forces. You see those blanks? Not so. If God is sovereign and governs all the affairs of our lives, then our real battle is with him. Have you learned that yet? Jacob, the consummate controller, had been able to manipulate both people and events. But on the banks of the Jabbok Creek, he discovers he can't control God. He's finally met his match. He's finally come to the end of himself. One lesson we should learn from Genesis 32 is that our real and ultimate battle in life is with God himself. Letter B, getting right with God precedes getting right with our brother. I want you to think right now about a broken relationship you have in your life somewhere. It may be something that happened long ago, but there's a relational chasm and there's someone with whom you've got a broken relationship. To get right horizontally, we must first get right vertically. In God's economy, our vertical relationship is intimately connected to our horizontal relationships. Reconciliation with God and reconciliation with others cannot be separated. Jesus said the two greatest commandments, love God, love neighbor. Those two go together. They dare not be separated. We dare not separate what God has joined together. Letter C. I don't know which of these is the most important. Victory comes through surrender. We win the battle when we raise the white flag and say, I surrender. In our battle with God, we win by losing. Jacob got the victory and the blessing not by wrestling, but by clinging. Our weakness becomes our greatest strength. You see, in the kingdom of God, the way up is down. Nothing wins like failure. In the kingdom of God, the way to win is to lose. The way to be strong is to be weak. The way to be rich is to give everything away. The way to be first 
is to be last. The way to find yourself is to lose yourself. The way to be wise is to become a fool. The way to be great is to become small. And the way to live is to die. Would you run that by me one more time? Isn't that a wonderful kingdom reality that Jacob discovered that he, he was strong when he was weak? He won the battle by losing the battle. He became great when he humbled himself and acknowledged what a no good, low down, dirty, rotten bum he really was. In fact, he became a saint when he realized what a sinner he was. What an amazing story. In our self despair, I'm back in my notes. In our self despair, we become bold and full of faith. In our self despair, we become bold and full of faith. Not my will, thine be done. That Gethsemane moment when even for Jesus, sweating drops of blood, he wrestled with his father. Let this cup pass. To see God's faith is a death sentence. The blank there, death sentence sentence. Exodus 33 verse 20 tells us that if you see God's face, you'll die. Jacob saw God's face and Jacob died. The old man died. Listen to how Oswald Chambers so magnificently sums it up. Jacob did see God face to face and he did die. So profound a death that God gave him a new name. That is always the test of the reality of sanctification. Not so much that I've received something, but that I've ceased to be my old self. On the banks of Jabbok Creek, Jacob died because Jacob saw God's face. Letter D, justification. Another thing we should learn from this wrestling match. Justification will be incomplete without sanctification. An authentic experience with God at Bethel 20 years earlier was indispensable for Jacob, but it was incomplete. I wonder for how many people who sit on pews of evangelical churches week after week for whom that would be true. They've had an experience of God. It's authentic. It's real. But it's incomplete. There needs to be a deepening of what God began. Without a deeper work of sanctifying grace at Peniel, Jacob's life would have been little more than a human tale of woe, one conflict after another. But at Peniel, Jacob experienced transformation. He became a new creation. God didn't just do something for him. God did something in him. Look at the chart, trying to just summarize what happened when Jacob became Israel. As Jacob, he was a controller. As Israel, he was controlled. He ceased controlling others and learned to let God control him. Jacob, the old man, was self-sufficient, but Israel was God-sufficient. Jacob was proud. What an arrogant rascal he was. But Israel, there was an aroma of humility about him. Jacob walked with a swagger. Israel walks with a limp. What a difference. 
Jacob knows about God. He had seen him there at the top of the ladder on the stairway to heaven. But Israel knew God face to face. Jacob builds pillars. Israel erects altars. Jacob says, my will be done. Israel says, God's will be done. Jacob, others see his strength. When Laban, when Esau looked at Jacob, they saw his strength. But Israel, when you looked at Israel, you saw his cane. You saw his limp. His weakness was visible to everyone. And that meant that for Jacob, he was invincible and threatening. Nobody wanted to get close to Jacob. But Israel was vulnerable and approachable. Let's summarize this in that last point by just simply making a comment that walking with a limp in the kingdom is a badge of honor. Walking with a limp. Now, when I talk about walking with a limp, I'm certainly talking about the physical limp that Jacob had. But I'm also talking here about other kinds of limps, emotional limps, psychological limps, relational limps, wounds and scars that many of us bear in wrestling matches we've had with God and we came out limping. Some loss, some defeat, some failure. When it felt like God had attacked us and hurt us and we limp. Jacob's limp, I'm back in my notes, was permanent. It was a tangible reminder to both him and everyone else that he had fought with God and he won the battle by losing. It was a magnificent limp. Think about with me for these closing moments what it means to walk with a limp. My wife Katie is in a wheelchair. We have a visible evidence of a limp in our lives that not only we are confronted with every day, but everyone who knows us. This has actually caused me to think deeply about what it means to limp in life. And I've been blessed by this Bible study. What does it mean to walk with the limp? Number one, it's humbling. An obvious deformity. An obvious handicap. There's something abnormal. Limping is not typically associated with strength and beauty. Anyone who limps is going to be a humble person because there's no swagger. There's no arrogance in a limp. That's a very good thing. Number two, limping, it is visible. Though some faults and deformities may be hidden, not so with a limp. Everyone sees you limp. To make it personal, when Katie and I go into a restaurant, everybody in the restaurant looks at us and they know immediately there's something abnormal, there's something deformed. It's so visible, the whole world sees your limp. They see where God has wounded you. Number three, it's painful. Typically, a limp involves a low level of pain that never quite goes away. People who limp hurt all the time. It may be low level, but their pain reminds them of their need. That's a good thing. 
Number four. Oh, this one has made me think. Those who limp, it slows one down. One with the limp may conceivably do most things that non-handicapped people do, but oh my goodness, it takes so much longer to fix your coffee, to take a shower, to get dressed. When Katie was still in the hospital after her stroke, a friend of ours, his name is Jerry, Jerry rides a horse and buggy. Jerry came to me in the hospital. He drove his car that day to the hospital. But he said to me something like this. He said, Stan, Katie was just in the next room, still in the hospital with the stroke. He said, Stan, life has slowed down for you, hasn't it? I said, yeah, Jerry, life has sure slowed down. And then Jerry said some of the most profound words I've ever heard in my life. Jerry said this, you know, when you ride in a horse and buggy, you see things along the highway that people in automobiles whisking by don't even know are there. I said, Jerry, that's a game changer. I'm going to remember that for the rest of my life. Thank you. Those who limp move a lot slower, but that's a good thing. Number five, a limp makes me weaker. The sinew of the hip is perhaps the strongest muscle in the entire body, and that's where Jacob was wounded. My strength is reduced, but strangely, how did Paul say it? When I am weak is when I am strong. Paul said, I had a thorn in the flesh. And three times I told God, God, if you'd remove or heal this thorn in the flesh, I could serve you more effectively. And three times God said, no, you can't. No, you can't. No, you can't. Because my strength shows up best in weakness. Number six, this limp is permanent. God's not going to heal this one. Though God theoretically could heal Jacob of this malady, he chooses not to. Apparently, he believes that Jacob is more effective in his, his service with the limp than without it. And number seven, I love this one. The meaning of a limp, it makes one non-threatening. Prior to this moment, Jacob threatened everybody. Just his demeanor, his character, the way he walked into a room, nobody wanted to get close to Jacob. But when he limped into a room, even Esau ran up to him and hugged him because there's nothing threatening in a man who limps. Others are quick to approach someone with an obvious handicap because of their weakened, because their weakened condition makes them approachable and invites others to come close. Over and over when Katie are out in public, I marvel at how people young and old will just come up to us, talk to us, greet us, hold the door for us. Why? Because there's something about weakness that invites intimacy. On the back of your notes... I couldn't have this Bible study without introducing you to this hymn that Charles Wesley wrote, Come, O Thou Traveler Unknown. Some think this was the greatest hymn Charles Wesley ever wrote. It's really making autobiographical the story of Jacob's wrestling match into Charles Wesley's own personal journey. He makes Jacob's story his story. Let me just read a few of these verses to you and invite you, 
when you have time later this week to just use these verses for your personal devotion and let Jacob's story become personalized in your own, own life. Come, O thou traveler unknown, whom still I hold but cannot see. My company before is gone, and I am left alone with thee. With thee all night I mean to stay and wrestle till the break of day. I need not tell thee who I am, my misery and sin declare. Thyself hast called me by my name. Look on thy hands and read it there. But who, I ask thee, who art thou? Tell me thy name and tell me now. Skip down to the bottom verse on that column. My strength is gone, my nature dies. I sink beneath thy weighty hand. Faint to revise, revive and fall to rise. I fall and yet by faith I stand. I stand and will not let thee go till I thy name, thy nature know. Jacob is telling the angel, I want to know who you are. Tell me your name. Yield to me now, for I am weak, but confident in self-despair. That's my favorite line in the whole hymn. I'm confident in my self-despair because the one I'm wrestling with Though he's reminding me of the true condition of my sinful heart is the one who loves me and can transform me. And I'm wrestling with, to, with him in full body contact. Yield to me now for I am weak, but confident in self-despair. Speak to my heart in blessing speak. Be conquered by my instant prayer. Speak, or thou never hence shall move, and tell me if thy name is love. Tis love, tis love, thou diedst for me. I hear thy whisper in my heart. The morning breaks, the shadows flee. Pure universal love thou art. To me, to all thy mercies move. Thy nature and thy name is love. And the very last verse, lame as I am, I take the prey, hell, earth, and sin with ease overcome. I leap for joy, pursue my way, and as a bounding heart fly home through all eternity to prove thy nature and thy name is love. Marvelous passage. Let me give you the benediction that Moses used to bless God's people. And listen to how he speaks of God's face. Here's the benediction. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance, his face upon you. And may the Lord give you shalom, peace. Amen.